You can't beat simplicity. And as a hardened rally man, I've always taken a very Spartan approach to the great outdoors. But not everybody feels the same. And since time immemorial, people have been trying to bring their home comforts out into the countryside. Of course, I'm talking about caravans, the bane of the B-roads and an anathema to the performance-minded motorist. But however much you may loathe them, period portables have a strong following. 25 vans gathered in the Midlands last summer. As befits such a gentle pastime, the air was not thick with the smell of burnt rubber and warm castrol R. Instead, kettles were boiled, deck chairs stretched and caravans cleaned with a homely pride. Like motoring in general, caravanning was the preserve of the rich in the first part of the century. This Morris Major cost around £170 in 1929, and the Eccles van it's towing cost almost as much. The company was the first to produce vans in any numbers, and this one was designed as a picnic caravan, more for day trips than holidays. Eccles were also one of the first to build motor caravans, one of which is being lovingly recreated by Paul Budgeon on the chassis of a 1930 Austin Heavy 10. I thoroughly enjoy it. It might be my masochistic instinct, I really don't know. There's something very primitive about it. Getting your hands dirty on one of these, well, you do achieve results. Unlike a modern vehicle, lift the bonnet on one of those. If it's broken down, you can't always repair it. Invariably, with this type of vehicle, there's always a means of getting it home. The Lantern House makes a fine lookout place. It's a unique home. And so is the caravan, really. This V8 is towing a car-like caravan. This film by Ford dates from the 30s when caravanning gained popularity, heavily promoted by Autocar magazine, organisers of the first caravan rally. Sleeping accommodation is almost Ritz-like in its luxurious ease. The same can't really be said of this automatic telescopic caravan, designed to be towed by the new breed of small cars like the Austin 7. Finished in Gaboon mahogany and advertised as an hotel to yourself where you wish, it came with leaded lights and a bay window, all for £105. Now, this is rather nifty. This is the original number plate, and it doubles up as a step to get on board. Actually, it's very reminiscent of a railway carriage here up in the roof and the luggage rack. Apparently, these caravans were hired out to sales representatives in the 30s who used to trundle around the country with them and sleep in them at night. That was before the days of travel lodges, of course. Now, it's got all mod cons. Underneath the doily here, we have this little hand basin. And on the opposite side, we have this splendid cooker. Two hot plates, and then here, a little oven for the Sunday joint. Now, the lights are interesting. These are electric, powered by the car battery, because they hadn't invented bottle gas in those days. And this frame folds out to create a table or a bed. Now, if you have the misfortune to suffer a puncture, well, you've got real problems. Having put the bed up, you've then got to remove this, undo the wheel nuts, and then lift the whole wheel up through the inside of the caravan. By the 50s, things have become much more sophisticated. This is a French manufactured caravan called a Scargo, and it has all sorts of examples of Gallic flair. Frameless windows, fitted cupboards everywhere, central heating, and this little device. Very cosy. The 50s and 60s were the start of the caravan's heyday, peaking in the early 70s when over 60,000 were produced a year. And to ensure safe vanning, Dunlop made this film to explain van law in mind-numbing detail. Here comes summer, and off come the wraps for another season of carefree caravanning. Now, don't let anyone distract you. They can get on with the packing on their own. You've got some important work of your own to do. If the caravan gives up the ghost on the motorway, you know who the women will blame. Not that it should, you seem to know your stuff when it comes to caravans. You wrapped the tyres up last autumn in strong paper and hessian so they wouldn't crack with the air getting at them. Stood the van on concrete and turned the wheels now and then so the same bits weren't taking all the weight. And this certainly isn't the first pressure check you've made. Oh dear, she's lost the bung from the thermos. She'd have plenty to say if you'd lost the valve cap. It's that kind of tedious thoroughness that has given caravanning its less than glamorous image. But the historic scene has a greater selection of characterful vehicles and owners, none more so than Captain C.C. Green, who built the extraordinary Mog 7 in 1954, a Winnebago before the word was invented. What's it like to drive? Very heavy. You're pushing the technology of 1954, when life wasn't made easy for the driver. 
When you built this, were there any uh, motorhomes, Winnie Bagos, and all these sorts of things no, around? No, nothing like that available. This was hatched out of army experience, and we put it together with firewood and canvas, and found we'd got a motor caravan. We found it was very, very handy to be able to roll out of the driver's seat, crawl into the back, and kick down. What Mog 7 lacks in speed, it makes up for in individuality. Like other historic caravans, it belongs to an age when roads were empty, machines were simple, and every journey was an adventure. Sweetheart.